Gentlemen, I'm President of PEN America, and I want to welcome you to the 13th Annual PEN World Voices Festival. I want to start by expressing huge thanks to Rob Spillman and to Kim Chan, who have pulled this festival together. brilliant work at all of the incredible events, many of which I hope all of you will go to, um, they're one better than the next, are uh, all possible due to their uh, focus in the industry. And as you know, this year we're focused on gender and power, and tonight we're united against hate. And those two themes line up pretty well, I think. A few days ago, I was out with my seven-year-old son, and we went past a mailbox on which someone had graffitied, fuck Donald Trump. And as we went by, George looked at it and he said, technically I agree with them, but I would have found a nicer way to say it. <laughs> this festival is a nicer way to say it. A few months ago, Theresa May, addressing the Conservative Party, said, There is no such thing as a citizen of the world. If you think you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. You don't even know what the word citizenship means. And I believe that Theresa May is dead wrong. I believe that patriotism is not nationalism. And I believe you can love your own country and love other countries too. And I believe that if identity politics has given us nothing else, it has given us the vocabulary of intersectionality and the understanding that all of us have multiple identities all the time and that it's a hallmark of sophistication and of a sound society to be always open to that variety and always exploring it. This festival is about the global world. It's about bringing people from many countries together to speak to one another. It was hatched in the wake of 9-11 at a time when there was a need for international understanding and helped to foster the spirit of internationalism that obtained for so long. But now, on the far side of that, we find the need once more, not only to bring these voices together, but to remember why they are important. The voices of people from abroad, the voices of immigrants within our own society, the voices of difference and diversity that have come to define us. The English majors in the room, which is probably two-thirds of you, <laughs> will remember that Robert Frost wrote, Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down, to which his neighbor can only say, good fences make good neighbors. But I think we all know that good fences, in fact, make real enemies and that this talk of a wall between the United States and Mexico, of the Great Wall of Calais built by Britain to stem immigration from continental Europe, of the massive border fence proposed in Hungary, of the increasing walling off of the State of Israel, these walls become our burqas. They are meant to keep us safe, and instead, they oppress us. When I was working on an article in Tripoli some years ago, I met with every member of Gaddafi's cabinet. And I was struck that the people who most wanted rapprochement with the West were the ones who had lived or studied in the US, the UK, or Western Europe. And the people who most wanted to continue work as a rogue terrorist state were the people who had spent very little time outside of Libya. We think that quarantining otherness somehow makes us safe but quarantining otherness engenders hatred. It is openness that makes us safe.
I will turn the stage over to the writers, but let me just say before I go that while internationalism is complicated and could go wrong, while there are many instances in which people are exploitative of less advantaged people in countries that are developing, that the underlying truth is that internationalism is the only way forward, and that's what this festival is about, to raise a may had it inside out. We must take action as citizens of our own countries and yet embrace a larger whole. Believing we cannot be citizens of the world will lose us the world of which we might have hoped to be citizens. Thank you. Festival. I want to thank my fellow curators. Thank you for all your work in putting this together. Thank you to all the Penn volunteers who have uh, given generously. Thank you especially to Kim Chan and Julia Tolo who have been unflagging and amazing. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all the Penn staff who have made this possible as well. Um, Thank you, New York City, for being an amazing host. Um, you know, you all know that this is Lincoln's lectern that he gave the House Divided speech uh, in 1860. And his words are more apt than ever. So um, please, after the show, join us for a quick vigil outside for truth. It's our little May Day event. It'll be quick. It'll be a vigil for truth. It'll be. Uh, some really interesting projections of uh, poetry on the, the postcards as well. And um, thank you all. I hope you all come out for the entire week. We have an amazing uh, series of over 70 events. Yeah, follow that, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Patty. And listen, look at all of you. It's so wonderful to have you here, filling this space, filling this great, bold, important, history-filled hall to express the thing we're all here to express, which is our feelings about what's happening in this country and how to resist it. I'd like you to just, I know Patty, watch you on your feet singing and dancing, I'd like you to do one thing for me. Would you just stand up? Stand up and express your unity against hate. You know, this festival, Pen World Voices, was born in 2005, soon after the beginning of the second term of the presidency of George W. Bush, of fond memory. <laughs> <laughs> at a time when it seemed to us here at Penn that a rift had grown up between the United States and the rest of the world, or much of the rest of the world, a rift that, in our opinion, benefited nobody, neither the United States nor the rest of the world. We thought we should do what writers could do, to restart a dialogue between America and the world by inviting the best of the world's writers here to New York City to talk about their ideas and their work and to engage in discussion with American writers. We also believed it was kind of crazy that New York City, which has international festivals of everything, did not have an international literary festival. That first year, I remember, the writers of World Voices included Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie from Nigeria, Save it to the end. <laughs> Paul Oster from Brooklyn. <laughs> Brayton Breitenbach from South Africa. Nurendin Farah from Somalia. Richard Kapuscinski from Poland. Elif Shafak from Turkey. Hanan Al Sheikh from Lebanon. Wole Shoyenka from Nigeria. Ungugi Watiango from Kenya. 
and Chico Buarque from Brazil. Not a bad lineup. We've got another one in the year. We had no idea who would come or if anybody would come. Instead, the audiences were huge and enthusiastic, and it became plain to us that we had created something that you wanted, even if you didn't know you wanted it till we created it. We were both relieved and proud. Since then, the audiences, look at all of you, have gone on growing, and World Voices is established as one of the world's leading literary festivals, and that would not have happened if you guys hadn't kept on coming. So thank you all very much. From the very beginning, this has been a little more than just a literary festival. It was and is also a place where the pen mission is spoken about and advanced, and where abuses of power abroad or here in America are challenged and opposed. And so here we are, at the beginning of the 13th iteration of World Voices, facing a new challenge, at least as great, if not greater, than the challenges of 2005. From the highest and most powerful places in America, we face an attack on the arts, a threat to defund them, and beyond the arts, on journalism, and beyond journalism, on the idea of truth itself. Truth as something objective, beyond personal opinion or prejudice, truth meaning the primacy of facts backed up by evidence. We face a moment in which untruth pollutes our lives on a daily basis, and in which many bigots, big is it against the media, yes, but also against immigrants, Mexicans, minorities, the LGBTQ community, women, and so-called elites, these bigots seem to have been set free by the result of the presidential election, and consequently our public discourse has already been greatly disfigured. <coughs> May I parenthetically object to the distortion in this meaning of the word elites? How is it allowed to happen that a government of billionaires and bankers, in which is accumulated more personal wealth than in any previous government in American history, is able to dismiss its adversaries as elites while it claims to speak for the masses. Very few novelists or journalists own private planes or clubs in Florida or golf courses in New Jersey. Very few of these supposed out-of-touch elites, that's us, live so utterly sequestered from ordinary people as this cabinet of billionaires. And yet we are the elites, we're the ones in the bubble. Let's start by reclaiming this single word. Let's call things by their proper names. We are facing the most shamelessly elitist administration in the history of the United States. Anyone who doesn't see that, to paraphrase something Stephen King said the other day, isn't paying attention. <laughs> this is a time of crisis. The best lose all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity, Yeats wrote in The Second Coming, ending with the lines, And what rough beast, it's our come round at last slouches towards Washington to be born. <laughs> oh, no. No. Bethlehem, Bethlehem. Bethlehem, not Washington, not at all. This crisis is not only an internal crisis. I worry for the future of this festival, frankly. If the administration succeeds in making entry into America a much more difficult and unpleasant experience. Will the world's writers want to brave U.S. immigration? Already there is much anecdotal evidence of bullying at the points of entry, of people at the border being asked what they think of the president by immigration officers, as if that were a criterion by which their right to enter America was to be determined. Already we hear of a probable drop in visitors to America this year by 20% or more. 
that rift between this country and the world is reopening. I hope and I call on the world's writers not to be deterred from joining us here so that we can go on doing what we can do to speak across that gulf. I believe that in this time, when the idea of a better America, diverse, open, tolerant and civilized, is everywhere under assault, it falls to us, to all of us, writers, publishers, booksellers, readers, citizens, to be the guardians of the culture, to be in what we say and how we act, embodiments and protectors of that better America. Because America is better than Trumpistan. <laughs> America is better than these people for whom the Second Amendment is sacrosanct, but the First Amendment not so much. <laughs> America is better than bullying and bigotry and hatred. If one good thing has come out of this dark moment, it is that so many Americans have been politically galvanized, perhaps as never before. So perhaps there is assembling an army of the good, an army of peace and justice united against hate that will stand in the way of the forces unleashed against us. As Paddy said, we're not going to win every battle, but we're damn well going to try. I believe that this new movement exists and needs to be nurtured and will be. And if I can finish by using an old form of words, we shall not be moved. Thank you. Et maintenant, and now, C'est mon grand honneur de vous introduire. It's my great honor to introduce to you mon ami, le grand poète syrien, my friend, the great Syrian poet, Ali Ahmed Saïd Esper, appelé Adonis. Adonis. Rachel Eliza Griffiths, who will read the translations of his poetry. Thank you. Good evening. So I will read um, the poem, which is called A Psalm, and then Adonis will read it in Arabic. Psalm. I toy with my nation. I see its future glimpsed through the eyelashes of an ostrich. I toy with its history and days and fall on them like meteor and storm. On the other side of daylight, I begin its history again, a stranger to you. I reside on the other edge, a nation that belongs only to me. In sleep and in waking, I open a blossom and live inside it. It's necessary that something else comes alive. This is why I open caves under my skin for lightning to charge, and I build nests for it to reside. It's necessary that I cross like thunder through sad lips parched like straw, through autumn and stone, between skin and pores, between thigh and thigh. This is why I sing, come to me, shape that suits our dying. This is why I scream and sing, who will let us mother this space? Who is feeding death to us? 
I move toward myself and toward ruins. The hush of catastrophe overtakes me. I am too short to circle around the earth like a rope and not sharp enough to pierce through the face of history. You want me to be like you. You cook me in the cauldron of your prayers. You mix me with the soldier's soup and the king's spices. Then pitch me as tent for your governor and raise my skull as his flag. Ah, my death, come what may. I am still heading toward you, running, running, running. A distance the size of a mirage separates you from me. I rouse the hyenas in you, and I rouse the gods. I plant schism within you and inflame you with fever. Then I teach you to travel without guides. I am a pole among your cardinal directions and a spring walking the earth. I am a trembling in your throats. Your words are smeared with my blood. You creep toward me like lizards as I am tied to your dirt. But nothing binds us and everything separates us. I'll burn alone and I'll pierce through you a spear of light. I cannot live with you. I cannot live but with you. You are tidal waves inside my senses. There is no escape from you. Go ahead, scream, the sea, the sea, but be sure to hang above your thresholds beads made out of the sun. Rip open my memory, search for my face under its words, search for my alphabet. When you see foam weaving my flesh and stone flowing in my blood, you will see me then. <coughs> Shielded as if inside a tree's trunk, present and ungraspable like air, I will never surrender to you. I was born inside the folds of lilac, grew up on an orbit of lightning, and now live between light and grass. I storm and I waken, I gleam and cloud, I rain and snow, the hours are my language, and daylight is my homeland. People are asleep, and only when they die do they awaken. Or, as it has been said, never become conscious in your sleep, otherwise you will die. Or, as it will be said, you are dirt on my window panes, I must wipe you off. I am the morning coming down, the map that draws itself. Still, there is a fever inside me that burns for you all night through. And I wait for you in the shell of night by the shore and the hum roaring from the depth of the sea and the holes in the skies escape in linden and acacia among pines and cedars in the underbelly of the waves in salt. I wait for you. أسلمت أسلمت أيامي لهاوية تعلو وتهبط تحت مركبتي وحفرت في عيني مقبرتي أنا سيد الأشباح أمنحها جنسي وأمس منحتها لغتي وبكيت للتاريخ منهزما متعثرا يكبو على شفتي وبكيت للرعب الذي احترقت أشجاره الخضراء في رئتي أنا سيد الأشباح أوقظها وأسوقها بدمي 
وحنجرتي الشمس قبرة رميت لها أنشوطتي والريح قبعتي ذلك الطفل ذلك الطفل الذي كنت أثاني مرة وجها غريبا لم يقل شيئا مشينا وكلانا يرمق الآخر في صمت خطانا نهر يجري غريبا جمعتنا باسم هذا الورق الضارب في الريح الأصول وافترقنا غابة تكتبها الأرض وترويها الفصول أيها الطفل الذي كنت تقدم ما الذي يجمعنا الآن وماذا سنقول opportunity to stand at Mr. Lincoln's lectern. <laughs> I'll regret it, but I want to be close to my guitar. <laughs> so I'll be here if that's okay. I'm going to do something I never do, which is read from a piece of paper. Yeah. I figured I'm not alone tonight, so it's cool. Um, and these words are just really actually context for what I really came to say. <laughs> But uh, here we go, okay. So we've been living with this bright shining object called the internet for so several decades now, and the curses that form the shadow side of its blessings have engulfed more than a few of us. Slowly we've been forced to recognize that its potential to create uplifting connections and increased awareness is just one side of the dueling forces unleashed by this miracle of ones and zeros. The shadow side of this technology is the isolation and anonymity it brings to bear, which has a power, even a propensity, to animate a dark force residing deep within the folds of human nature, where compassion cannot reach, like road rage between one metal box on wheels and another. The nature of disconnection is blindness and the absence of consciousness. Having had my own personal run-in with the internet and the immense pain it can inflict, I began after about two years of physical and mental recovery to deeply contemplate the nature of consciousness and eventually to come to think of it as simply put, a thing made of relationship. Call me a feminist, but there is no consciousness in a singularity, which is to say singularities do not exist. A quantum physicist can tell you any one thing exists only as an endless field of possibility until the moment it is observed. Observation is synonymous with interaction, and with interaction springs existence. I began to train my eye to recognize this essential structure of relationship underlying the known universe, and as a result, the binary principle began to show itself to me everywhere, from the dance of positive and negative ions in the atomic structure to the dance of planets and stars. 
from the male and female, which interplay in creation to the dialogue of darkness and light we call time. Relationship is at the core of the grand design. Cell death is the mechanism by which a being grows and evolves, beings collectively entering life and then death and then life again is how a species evolves, whether it be the life of an insect, a mountain, or a star, what we think of as life is really the endless enchanted conversation of life and death. The human brain is an exquisite example of binary design. Flowing down into a single spinal cord are two distinct processing centers with two distinct personalities, ways of knowing, sets of abilities. This binary principle is echoed throughout our bodies. With one ear we hear, but only with two ears can we perceive the full spectrum of depth and position. Only in stereo can our world be fully perceived. I can only really know myself through your eyes, and you in turn through mine, to feel each other to be connected to one another and to everything is to be fully alive within ourselves. This idea that refuses to let me go, that nothing can truly exist except in relationship, is the context for which I would like to talk to you about patriarchy. <laughs> in perilous and regressive political times, but we also find ourselves in hopeful and inspiring times. The energy of resistance is strong, stronger than in a long time. And we can see the vanguard of the resistance is feminine, feminist. And I think we can infer from the nature of the resistance, the nature of the force being resisted. And I hope that in this very inspiring, hopeful time, we can find an appetite to recognize patriarchy Fascism is made of patriarchy. <laughs> Environmental destruction, war, racism, all manifestations of hierarchy, of dominance and submission, of aggression. It's feminism, this mechanism by which we have to address patriarchy, the, the path that we can take out of here then becomes not just a matter of emancipating and empowering women, but emancipating and empowering the feminine in all of us. I think in this binary universe, peace is a function of balance. You know, whether you're looking at this metropolis of cells you call your body, or this metropolis of bodies we call society, or, or city, or country, or an ecosystem, or the whole planet, imbalance begets turmoil, strife, disease, balance begets peace. I ask you to look at the fundamental imbalance of patriarchy that underlies all of our political, social, cultural, religious systems. I invite you, if you have not yet felt invited, <laughs> 
to recognize yourself as a feminist, and to engage in the resistance with that spirit.
In the blue glow of gizmos Lurk despots in diapers And cyborgs with bullhorns And crackpots and snipers Like robots so always To cheese they dismiss you Soon to fuck you then kiss you Soon to kick you and diss you They got networks like insects With webs of deception They'll trap you, cocoon you Like a department of corrections They curl up colors And senses and creeds they got all kind of issues, they got all kind of needs Little laboratory monkeys, raised with no hugging Just wire cage mama and lab coats mugging I feel your anger, I feel your pain I feel the ache and hole in your soul that can't be named Yes, consciousness is binary, consciousness is spinning Consciousness is a circuit when consciousness is winning Consciousness is binary, consciousness is spinning Consciousness is a circuit when consciousness is winning You gotta complete the circuit Alone there's just no knowing Yet energy is destructive Unless it is flowing And the connection lies the spark In the connection lies the heart You gotta be up in someone's countenance Conversing with their heart You gotta complete the circuit Not just with human beings With the sky above with the earth beneath your feet when you complete the circuit with everything that lives borders get blurry and the rest is adjectives borders get blurry and the rest is adjectives consciousness is binary consciousness is spinning consciousness is a circuit when consciousness is winning consciousness is binary consciousness is spinning consciousness is a circuit when Consciousness is winning. Where are my sisters? Where are my brothers? Where is my family who takes care of each other? Where are my sisters? Where are my brothers? Where is my family who takes care of each other? Where are my sisters? Where are my brothers? Where is my family who takes care of classroom of Fort Farm, boys in the stink of Dracar and Noir Cologne, boys trying to b-boy up school uniforms by opening three shirt buttons while letting the pants slump and crumble on the top of Reebok pumps, boys swaggering to the bus stop walking semi-crap style to LL Cool J, boys spitting on the pavement and chatting new lingo imported from New York, that was stupid fresh. Boys spreading out of the purgatory of chin and pubic hair baldness. Boys in school with boys making a performance of how much they know girls. 36 boys watching you. Boys who go to class with just boys have to prove it all day. Meanwhile, you've been listening to Prince too long. 1984 was two years ago and everybody is a chacha boy or a b-boy now. Listening to Prince makes you a fag. At school prayers, the principal mentions a boy with no name, expelled because he was caught in the midst of inappropriate activity. It takes a week for everybody to notice one boy missing, an actor and a comedian. You know what they say about boys with talents. Maybe you should get a C for your next art assignment, fail on purpose, and get boys to like you. 
Boys shouldn't act like girls, but to be with the boys, you must do what the girls do. Set your brain on dim so that the boys will call you over to their lunchtime stoop. At the gate with the chacha boys, on the steps with the brainy boys, popping and locking with the bee boys, at the fence with the fuck boys, outside the principal's office with the white boys. Do it now. Put your brain on dim and use that spillover energy to watch yourself. Look at you now, asking the kid to borrow his ruler. You stick your hand out barely four seconds before the wrist droops. The hand sags, limp wrister. You swing your wrist back straight, but not before the boy, two class rows down, hisses and flicks his own wrist to match yours, you faggot. Keep your hands to the side next time. If you must extend your hand, every joint should be kept at nothing next to 90 degrees. Boys are watching. And your legs are too close together. Boys sit as if their thighs are made out of the backsides of magnets. <laughs> Why you sit so narrow? You have a pussy to protect? But boys who sit wide have crotches on display, don't look. St stand up, then sit down with your legs wide apart. Stand up, then sit down with your legs wider. Stand up, then sit down until your tendons scream. Don't sit up straight. Hang off to one side and let your head rest on the chair. Get Reeboks or Nikes and don't come in here with leather shoes again. At least you like Bon Jovi. When you walk, swing your arms wider. Keep them to your sides, make it, makes you look like you're gliding and boys will call you a floating faggot. Did your hips just sway? Don't laugh, you laugh like a girl. And don't respond when they tease. In fact, just don't say anything. Never, and this is important, never ever volunteer to answer any question asked by a teacher that demands more than one word. Kneel like a man, sit like a man. One foot must be on the ground at all times. When cool boys ask you to do their homework, do it. When they call you homo in public, laugh at the butt of the joke is always walking away from both of you. And when they ask you to do their homework two days later, do it again. Get a cool boy haircut. Practice lowering your voice in the mirror. Study dancehall reggae and use one or two words of local slang in at least 1.5 sentences a day. In lieu of actual girls, make it be known that you have a grooming collection of pornography. Stop drawing art. Art is for faggots. Draw breasts, butts, and lips with women attached. Did you just cross your legs at the knee? Boys don't cross legs. Play football. Consider joining the inter-school's Christian fellowship since nobody has the balls to mess with God. When, all, when, all the, when, all the, when one of the boys says, He's faggy, but he's brainy. Accept this as a good a compliment as you're ever gonna get. Watch as cool boys discuss you with a teacher. One of the boys, the bully whose homework you still do. You know, you're cool. You're really cool. It's just... He never finishes a sentence, and you never ask him to. But you live in that ellipsis for 17 years. Wishing more than anything, he told you what was wrong so you could fix it. You want to fix it more than anything. But there are many ways to fix something. And later, when you walk all the way downtown, you walk past roads, shops, signs, mornings, sea salted docks and gulls, until your shoes are two inches off the pier with a ship blocking your view of the sea. A man says, only yesterday, some boy fall off and land between the dock and the ship. He couldn't swim out. You look down at the narrow space between the dock and the ship and realize it could suck you up so quickly, nobody would know you're gone. What the fuck you doing, boy? You forget that you never walked to downtown alone, that even rejects have friends, with little in common other than being stomped on by the same foot. You can get through anything when you're seven strong, because even in a boy's school, boys find boys who may not share girlfriend names but share X-Men comics. Not parties, but early afternoon matinees. Not stolen beer, but traded Dungeons and Dragons cards. Not sex tips, but poetry, paintbrushes, inks, and paper. And all of that Live Aid concert on one VHS. <laughs> the antisocial cusser, the art kid, the poor boy, the art fag, the fag fag, the nerd, the fat boy. The new kid who will realize this coming summer that he can do better than us. I'm not doing anything, I'm just watching the sea. You're just watching the sea? 
Yeah, I'm just watching to see. Thank you. If they ask you to burn the flag, wave it. If they ask you to murder, recreate. Theorem, anti-theorem, corollary, anti-corollary. Underline it twice. It's all there in the numbers. Listen to your mother. Listen to me, Joshua. Look me in the eyes. I have something to tell you. But he stood, buzz-haired and red-cheeked in front of her, and she said nothing. Say something to him that shine to his cheeks. Say something, tell him, tell him. But she just smiled. Solomon pressed the star of David into his hands and turned away and said, be brave, son. She kissed his forehead goodbye. She noticed the way the back of his uniform creased and uncreased in perfect symmetry. And she knew, she just knew, the moment she saw him go, that she was seeing him go forever. Hello, Central, give me heaven. I think my Joshua is there. 
can't indulge this heart sickness. No, spoon the coffee out and line the tea bags up. Imagine endurance. There's a logic to that. Imagine and hang on. So, how is it being dead, son? And would I like it? Oh, the buzzer. Oh, oh, spoon clang to the floor. Oh, stepping quickly along the corridor. Return, pick up the spoon. Everything neat now, neat now, yes. Give me back his living body, Mr. Nixon, and we will not quarrel. Take this corpse, all 52 years of it, swap it. I won't regret it. I won't complain. Just give me my son back, all sewn up and handsome. Control yourself, Claire. I shall not fall apart. No. Quick now, door-wise, at the buzzer. Her mind, she knows, needs a quick dip in water. A momentary cold swell, like those little buckets outside a Catholic church. Dip in and be healed. Yes? Your visitors, Mrs. Salzburg. Oh, yes. Send them up. Too harsh, too quick. I should have said wonderful, great, with a big swell to my voice instead of send them up. Not even please, like hired hands, plumbers, decorators, soldiers, critics. She engages the button to listen in. Curious thing, the old intercoms. Faint static and buzz, and some laughter and door close. The elevator straight ahead, ladies. Well, at least there's that. At least he didn't show them to the service elevator. At least they're in the warm mahogany box. No, not that. The elevator. The faint mumble of voices, all of them together. They must have met up beforehand, prearranged. I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't let it cross my mind. I wish they hadn't. Talked about me, maybe. Needs a doctor. Awful grey streak in her hair. Her husband's a judge. Wears implausible sneakers. Struggles to smile. Lives at a penthouse but calls her upstairs. Is terribly nervous. Thinks she's one of the gals. But she's really just a snob. Is likely to break down. How to greet them? Handshake? Air kiss? Smile? The first time around, they had hoped goodbye, all of them together in Staten Island at the doorstep, with the taxi beeping, her eyes streaked with tears, arms round one another, all of us happy at Marsha's house, when Janet pointed to a yellow balloon caught in the treetops. Oh, let's meet again soon. And Gloria had squeezed her arm. They touched cheeks. Our boys? Our boys? Do you think they knew each other? Claire, do you think they were friends? War. The disgusting proximity of it. Its body odour. Its breath on her neck all this time. Two years now since pull out. Three, two and a half, five million, doesn't matter, nothing's over. The cream becomes the milk. The first star at morning is the last one at night. Did she think they were friends, our boys? Well, they could have been, Gloria. They certainly could have been. Vietnam was as good a place as any to start. Yes, indeed. Dr. King had a dream, and it would not be gassed on the shores of Saigon. When the good doctor was shot, she sent a thousand dollars and twenty dollar bills to his church in Atlanta. Her father raved and roared, called it guilt money. She didn't care. There was plenty to be guilty for. She was modern, yes. She should have sent her whole inheritance. I like fathers. I just think everyone should disown one. <laughs> what? Like it or not, Daddy, it all goes to Dr. King. And what do you think of your niggers and your kikes now? Oh, the mezuzah on the door. Oh, I forgot about that. She touches it, stands in front of it, just tall enough to obscure it, the top of her head, the clang of the elevator. But why the shame? Why am I so shamed? Why? But it is not shame, really, is it? What is it possibly to be ashamed of? Solomon insisted on it years ago, that's all, for his own mother, to make her comfortable when she visited, to make her happy. And what is wrong with that? It did make her happy, isn't that enough? I have nothing to apologize for. I have scuttled around all morning with my lip, lips puckered, afraid to breathe, swallowed a big bag of air. I should have been a pair of ragged claws. 
What is it the young ones say? Get a grip. Hang on. Ropes and helmets and carabiners. What is it that I never said to Josh? She can see the numbers as they rise. A bustle from the elevator shaft and a loud chatter. They're comfortable already, the visitors. I wish I'd met them earlier in some coffee shop, but here they are, here they come. What was it I never said? Hello, she says, hello, hello, hello. Marsha, Jacqueline, look at you, come in. I love your shoes, Janet, this way. Gloria, oh, hi. Oh, look, please, come in. It's so lovely to see you. The only thing you need to know about the war, son, is don't go. And this, before we go into the last act of the evening for Sufla, who's a musician of our times, is another Wendell Berry poem that hopefully ties in with all the ones that we've lost and we should salute. It's called A Meeting. It's 12 lines. A Meeting. In a dream, I meet my dead friend. He has, I know, gone long and far, and yet he is the same, for the dead are changeless. They grow no older. It is I who have changed, grown strange to what I was. Yet I, the changed one, ask, how you been? He grins and looks at me. I've been eating peaches off some mighty fine trees. <laughs>
more for Sufala, please. Also, uh, thank you to all of our readers and performers tonight. They were all amazing. Thank you. And uh, join us for the rest of the week. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And please join us for a brief vigil outside, a vigil for truth. We'll be a little candlelight ceremony out there. And uh, we'll see you all out this week. Thank you all very much. <laughs>